This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud or demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove, wishing in gladness and in safety may all beings be at ease, whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease, let none deceive another, or despise any being in any state. <coughs> Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another, even as a mother protects with her life her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, freed from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding by not holding to fixed views, the pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Excellent. Done, over to you. Okay. So anyway, uh, today, uh, because always I never plan talks, but what's actually in your mind for what's happened today is always part of how I teach. So today we had a, a group of people from the, uh, used to be called the Cancer Support Association, now it's usually called Solaris, but a group of people who come to monastery once a year, I go to their place once a year, and they were just leading them in a meditation, talking to them about really good attitudes to do with any cancers. And of course, there was this uh, few days ago, one of our supporters who came for our entry to the range day on Sunday, she did complain that she had some trouble with her ears. And so I told her the story of this uh, man who also had you know, many troubles in his life, but he went to the, the church to get some, uh, some help. And the pastor asked him, what's wrong with you, sir? 
And he said, um, I've, I've got a problem with my hearing. And so the, the pastor, the church leader, put his hand over the man's ear, did some invocations, and tapped him and he said, there, can you hear now? And the man said, it's not a problem with my ears, I've got a hearing tomorrow in the court. I want some help with my hearing. Okay, a few of you are smiling. <laughs> Thank you so much. Because, <laughs> oh, Yvonne and Caddington, you're really laughing. Very good. Excellent. <laughs> There's many meanings of the word hearing. But anyway, many of the people who come to the cancer group, one of the most important things is to get them into a happy mind state. And that happy mind state, where you see positive energy, is very much to do with that old story from years ago when I first started building this monastery and I finished one wall and it had the two bad bricks in the wall and of course you all know the story by now I hope that for three months I really suffered until somebody came up and said I wanted to destroy that wall but somebody came up and said it's a beautiful wall why? can't you see the two bad bricks? It, yes, but I can also see the 998 good bricks as well. So it doesn't matter what's happening to you in your life, we always tend to have this understanding that it's so easy to see the faults in life and that makes us depressed. And we're not really being fair to life. We have a tendency as human beings always to see the faults in one another. You see the faults in me, all my bad jokes, but sometimes they're good jokes, sometimes. <laughs> so anyway, when we always see faults, we can never get that peace and happiness. A fault is always something we have to fix up. And it just bugs our mind all the time. But once we learn how to see the other half of life, the beautiful attitudes, we have like a positive mind state. And we always say that having a positive attitude is always good, except when you take a COVID test. In a COVID test, please don't be positive. <laughs> That's the only occasion when you shouldn't be positive. But nevertheless, that idea of not seeing the faults in things, but seeing the good things in life, that not only gives you this beautiful ability to smile, and have lots of friends, because people like being around people who make you laugh, who are positive, who see the nice part of life. But it also really helps with your meditation. That's why I introduced it here. That when you start to see life, and see it in the positive sides of life, I mean, most of the people in the Armadale group, not all of you, uh, I'm getting on a bit. <laughs> I'm being honest. I've known some of you for years. But nevertheless, even though you're, you're getting on a bit, still you have a positive mind state to see the benefits of old age. One of those benefits of old age means you, know, you don't have to think so much, you don't have so many duties to perform, which means you can be more peaceful. You can lessen the responsibilities in your life. And when you can re lessen the responsibilities in your life, it means that when you're meditating, you don't have to think so much. One of the important parts of meditation, and I was just explaining this to some of the monks uh, a couple of days ago, that uh, we can't be sure of the past. So why do we keep worrying about the past? And this is one of the stories which I, I always mention this to others, to actually impress the point that we cannot be sure what actually happened in the past. And this was the case of uh, my brother. My brother is still alive, he's two years older than, than I am. And he lives in England. And we always have a, an argument that one of us, only one of us, um, had German measles when we were young. And I always was absolutely convinced it was me. My brother is convinced it was him. So when my mother was still alive, 
who went to ask her said, no, we can't agree which one of us had German measles. And my mother replied, well, one of you did, but I can't remember which one. <laughs> In other words, not even she could help uh, overcome that argument. And that was wonderful because it was an argument which we cannot solve. So instead of trying to solve it, it was just a lovely little story which said that I not really know what happened so far in the past. Because if you want to know how a lot of memory works, a lot of memory works like the old story we used to say, we used to call this little game as kids called Chinese Whispers. The one a whole line of children would stand in a row and the teacher would whisper something to the first kid who would whisper it to the next one, who would whisper it to the next one, who would whisper it to the next one. And when it got to the last kid in the line, this, what was actually said at the beginning was totally different to what was actually said at the end. Every time, every part of that link, the message was distorted just a little bit. And I remember that was really important during the First World War, where apparently some general sort of sent the order out, send reinforcements, we're going to advance. And that message was sent from the general to the, I don't know, all the, the ranks in the army, the general to the colonel, the colonel to the major, the major to the lieutenant, the lieutenant to the captain, the captain to the sergeant, the sergeant to the corporal, the corporal to the private. And when it got to the private, the message had changed. Instead, send reinforcements, we're going to advance. It became, send three and four pence, the old British money, we're going to a dance. <laughs> And that actually was reality, that actually happened. And it was a good example that because when we remember something, we remember the last time we remembered it, which was the time we remembered it before. And every time we distort the information. So I say that because the past, we don't know what happened. So whatever things which you have done in the past, which you may be ashamed of, did you really do it? Why did you do it? The other person who hurts you, what did they do? Why did they do it? You don't really know. The past is to be let go of, to be forgiven, given all the actors in that past the benefit of the doubt. Don't be the prosecutor, be the defence attorney. And see how you can get them off the charge, rather than increase the charge. And I say that because that's part of kindness as well. We all make mistakes, and when we make mistakes, we learn from them. We don't punish ourselves, and we don't punish others. And if you can do something like that, you get free from such a burden in meditation. I mention that because many people, when they get into nice, peaceful meditation, they start to feel they don't deserve to go deeper. It's something which is, I come across as a teacher so many times. People get to some nice, beautiful, peaceful meditation and think, no, I don't deserve this. It's too pure, it's too peaceful, it's too happy, it's too free. Well, one of the things which I emphasize, and I use the, the word of the Buddha for this, everyone deserves to be enlightened. The only people who can't be enlightened are those people who have killed their mother or killed their father. If you haven't done any of that, then you're totally free to be enlightened. So if any of you have done that, you might as well turn off the, uh, the, <laughs> the uh, Zoom link to this group, because it's hopeless. <laughs> but if you haven't, it means you can. In other words, you all can. And when people say, yeah, but I'm a bad person, well, look what happened in the time of the Buddha. You had people like um, Angulimala. He was a serial killer. He got it lined. Patachara, and she was mad, crazy. You know, she came into the, the hall where the Buddha was giving a talk with no clothes on at all, totally naked. She was a young woman as well. And she became enlightened, one of the best teachers. You got people who had learning difficulties, they became enlightened. And it was wonderful just to see that everybody can. So never, ever, think there's something wrong with you, 
that you can't become enlightened. Even sometimes people who have had some very serious injuries happen to them in the past. People who have been abused or just uh, are damaged. I don't know why they use that term in the modern language, damaged goods. Because I've often mentioned that every human being is like a tree in the forest and every tree is damaged. I've never yet seen a perfect tree with no marks on the trunk, which is dead straight, which has got all the branches and twigs in the correct place, which has got no holes where a branch has fallen off, which has just got green leaves, no yellow leaves, no brown leaves, which has not got any infection on those leaves. I've never seen a tree in a forest over here which hasn't got burn marks from a bushfire. In fact, every tree which I've seen in Bodhinyana Monastery or Jhana Grove or in a nun's monastery or anywhere in West Australia, all those trees are crooked and bent and damaged. Every one of them. So that's one of the reasons why if ever you have any dealings with those uh, suffering what they call mental health problems, especially chronic ones which last for years, please let them know. They are like the bent, damaged trees in Bodhinyana Monastery. You belong. You're welcome. You're part of nature. And number two, personally, I always prefer the bent and damaged trees. They're the ones twisted all over the place. They're the ones which I like to visit. And if I have my photograph taken, that's where I'd like to have my photograph taken. Perfect trees are unnatural. They've got no beauty. So this is why everybody can have this beautiful path into deep peace and in that simile of acceptance. So one of the meditators in the cancer group said, well, what do I do when my body is hurting, when it's really suffering? Because of course they have many um, operations to have. Sometimes, you know, the sicknesses which you have to endure can be very uh, unpleasant. Chemotherapy, radiation therapy, it's all very difficult to take. So how can I meditate with a painful body? And that's when I, I told them that one of the best forms of meditation are based on those Emperor's Three Questions story, which Leo Tolstoy wrote. When is the most important time? It's always now. The past, you don't know if it, what you remember is true or not. Uh, the future, your future is being made right now. It's not fixed yet. So it's always you can change the future by making this present moment as peaceful and pure as you possibly can. So now is the only time which is important. And I pause here. Why is it that people can't stay in the present moment? Why is it you get dragged out into the fantasies of the past? And I mention that word clearly, fantasies of the past. Or even more fantasies of the future. Why? Because in the fantasy world you've got some control over it. You can always be a hero in your fantasies. In the real world it's sometimes you lose. So that's one of the reasons why people like going off into fantasies and dreams going on the internet, or even like sometimes getting drunk or on drugs, because they don't like the present moment. So now is the only time, but the only way you can actually stay there is number one, giving it importance and giving it care so the present moment appears delightful. And that's one of the things which I develop and teach in the meditation. From the very beginning of the meditation, bring delight into what you're doing. Remember, you're meditating. You're becoming peaceful. It's great for your health. And it's, other people realize that it's good for your health. Even years ago, when we had the Armadale group in Armadale, <laughs> and I remember this, this one woman, and she said, so she looked a bit tired and frazzled, and she said, I never really felt like coming to the group this evening. 
Uh, but so why, why did you come? He said, my, my kids sent me. I said, Mummy, it's meditation day, off you go. Oh, I don't feel like it today. Mummy, go to meditation. Why? And the kids said, because you are a much nicer mummy when you come back from meditation. Even the kids realised that you know, the mother is much easier to live with after the meditation. So that should give you this wonderful sense of joy and, and value that what you are doing is great for the people you have to live with, or rather the people who have to live with you. It enhances your ability to be a good mother, to be a good father, a good auntie, grandma, son, daughter, or whatever. That's one of the reasons you should value what you're doing. And when you value the meditation, or value the present moment, it's easier to stay there. You don't just go into the present moment in meditation and take it for granted. It's an amazing opportunity you have. You know, we're just starting our range retreat and I, this is my 48th range retreat. So all those years I still value this. It's so precious to have this time when you can have more time for me in my cave just to sit down and really relax to the max and get into deep meditation. So anyway, when you value something it's easy to stay with it. And so uh, now is the most important time and even if you are aching or sick, it's important to understand what the sickness is and how to uh, not fight it. Because the more you fight any sicknesses or unpleasant feelings, the more that they get you know, unpleasant for most people. So remember this is important. But I can't stand this any longer. If you ever think like that any longer, you're off into the future. It's okay right now, but what you think might happen, that is what makes it difficult. So right now it's here, you're with it, you're at peace. And the only thing to do with it is to care, to relax to the max. And I found that such a wonderful way of being with even unpleasant feelings. Because when you do really relax, you care for this moment rather than try to cure it then you find that that care just open. it feels like you're opening up parts of the body and sort of uh, healing energies can go there. It's why in meditation retreats often people actually when I ask some questions or in interviews they say that parts of their body got really warm they had really warm shoulders. Why? Just the rest of my body was cool but why my shoulder? And it's always the case well, that meant that they were getting very peaceful and had some injury there. A lot of times it was like a car accident or something and the whiplash they got from that car accident was still in there and when they relaxed that opened up channels of energy which could go to those parts of the body and could actually almost heal them. And so a lot of the time that heat in the body is like the energy is coming there and doing their job, what they're really meant to do. And so that's one of the reasons why that when you, even if you're in pain or you're aching, now is the most important time. What's in front of you is the most important meditation object. And what you're doing is caring for it. Like this beautiful opening the door of your heart to this moment. Not fighting it, not stigmatizing it because it hurts, but letting it be. Just in this moment, one moment at a time. It's amazing just how you can relax so deeply and get into some great meditations. And I say that because you know, I've been a monk a long time. I haven't always had an easy life. Sometimes it's been painful. Sometimes in big sicknesses, like one of those big sicknesses which I had was the scrub typhus in a hospital over in uh, Ubon, Rajatani. The monks were there for about three or four weeks. And I felt just so little energy. Probably the least energy I've ever had in my life. Because you know, a, a fever for about three weeks. And then I just decided to meditate, for goodness sake. How can you meditate with a fever like that? Basically, I'd never had any choice. So you just lay down there in the bed 
I just let go. I mean, I mean that, let go. I didn't have anything else to do. I got very peaceful and get, went inside the body, rather always trying to get rid of the feelings in the body to care for them. And then of course they relaxed and went inside. It's a wonderful meditation. And that was really fascinating because my posture was all over the place and I was, you know, zero energy, but I could still get into deep meditations. So it almost like proved something for myself. You see, attitude is more important than anything else. Now the most important time. Whatever it is you're experiencing, even if it's zero energy, aches, pains, fever, learn how to be with it instead of always being negative to it, trying to get rid of it. The fever is the body's way of trying to heal yourself. So just leave it alone, be with it, and see what happens. And if you can do something like that and care for it, it's amazing the benefits you get from meditation. And after a while, you just go deep inside your mind. You do become very peaceful. It's a natural process. The kindness and valuing whatever you're experiencing, that is like focusing. You don't do it. It's just what happens when this moment right now is really important. And you value this moment and you care for it. It becomes very lovely to watch. Which means you don't have to, you really, I get into trouble for this because people keep criticizing me for this, but I don't put any energy into my meditation. I don't force anything. Just, this is the moment. I value this moment. I care for it. And just the mind gets very peaceful, very still. And things disappear. And then you get to those beautiful meditations. All by themselves. I don't do it. So this is actually how to meditate deeply. And I wanted to uh, share this with you because you know this is the last talk which you're going to get from the monks for three months. If you want to talk, you can always come down to Bodhinyana Monastery, you can always discuss things with you. But it won't be sort of online. Okay, so I've got it at 7.30 now. So now we can do some meditation. Is that a good idea? Excellent. Whether it's a good idea or a bad idea, it's going to happen. So here we go. <laughs> so you sit in your chair, on your bed, if you're in Corsica, or see where other people are, people getting some nice cushions ready. Today, I'm just on a stool, a stool, like a chair, office chair. But I've been a monk for such a long time, I can just meditate almost anywhere. Actually, probably would be anywhere. So, close your eyes. With your eyes closed, now is the most important time. Where are you right now? It's been a lot of hard work just getting to this one place where you're sitting reasonably comfortable. The future, you know your future is being made by what you do now. So now is where we're going to stay. You know now is, if you really get in, into the present moment, it's like time vanishes. It has no meaning anymore. Now is the most important time. What are you aware of right now? Don't go looking for the breath or looking for loving kindness or peace or anything. Be realistic. What are you aware of in this moment? And please don't judge what you're aware of. Don't stigmatize it if it's not what you want. Even if it is peaceful, sometimes it's not peaceful enough. And that just creates more wanting. And even you get some deep meditation, you want deeper meditation. That's just going in the opposite direction. So whatever you're aware of right now, open the door of your heart to it. It's important. So we don't choose our object of meditation right now. Instead, we respect it. 
we're learning from it. Often when I listen to teachers, sometimes I didn't understand too much what, why they were saying it. But I knew it was important. So I stopped criticizing and just listened with a peaceful mind. What's happening right now is important. It's the only truth I have in this moment. And all I do to meditate is just to care for this moment. To really open the door of my heart to this moment. You can come in. Remember a door serves two functions. Things come in and things go out. So I've just got this door fully open. One of the things, maybe just because my habit I'm aware of right now is just how comfortable I am or how uncomfortable. That becomes a, an, almost like an image, a feeling which is prominent in my mind. It's just how my body works. This moment is really important. And I care for my body. I've cared for this body almost 71 years. It's been pretty healthy. It works. I've got a lot of respect and gratitude for my body. So I'm caring for it now. This is what's actually in front of my mind right now. The condition of my body. And I know that when I care for something in this moment, this happens again right now, I can feel it. The body relaxes so much. And I get this feeling, this delight in a relaxed body. That delight is supposed to happen. It's a sign that you are relaxing in a good way. You do this, this moment is the most important long enough. And the delight comes. It's because you're not fighting, you're not being negative, you're caring. And caring is, gives happiness to others, it also gives happiness to you. So things relax, you feel peaceful. And my body's really relaxed. And I don't choose what to be aware of next. Just with this happiness. But again, it's just because the way I've been trained. Next thing which comes up in my mind is just how peaceful this feels. And I do recognize that peace is not in the body. Peace is making this transition from the body to the mind. Peace is a mental a mind object, a state of mind. And peace is just what comes and what I'm aware of. And that's easy to be with. I care for it. It's important. And I just stay with this. The mind gets more and more peaceful. That's how it feels. If something else comes up, fine. I don't reject anything. The door is open. Maybe a, a thought comes up or a feeling in the body. I let it come in. The door is open. Once it's visited me, it can, it can leave whenever it wants, or it can stay as long as it wants. But I'm always kind. Whenever we regard the thoughts, if a thought comes into your mind during meditation, you never regard it as yours. It's important to be aware of it, but never own anything. It's not your memory. It's a memory, it's a thought. 
when you don't attach to it, you don't put this link between me and that thought. The thought can very easily just be like a cloud floating through the sky. It comes in, it will go out. It's just a temporary visitor. You don't get upset, you don't try to get rid of it because your job is just caring all the time. And then behind that disturbance was always the peace. Right? Peace is like the default state, the base state. So when these other things just disappear, you have this beautiful peace. And after a while, the peace just stays and takes over. You've been doing breath meditation, the breath will come into your mind by itself when it's ready. But don't go searching for it. Just let the mind relax to the max. Now the most important time. What you're aware of right now is the most important thing. And the most important, the only thing to do is to care. I'm going to be quiet now because I can't resist the deep meditations. I just, the mind is telling me to shut up. Oh, when I talk again, it'll be close to the end of the meditation.
getting close to the end of the meditation now. How do you feel? How did that work for you? How peaceful are you? And how does your body feel? comes out of a calm meditation. It feels so much better. So much more content. Can hardly find any stress anywhere. Everything's relaxed. going to ring the gong three times to end the meditation. When the last ringing of the gong disappears, please come out. Thank you for letting me. So now at the end of uh, the meditation session, we usually have another half an hour or more, depending on how long you let me, of a bit of questions and answers. So excellent, uh, John. I'm sure that uh, there are already some questions coming up in the chat. Would you like to roll off with one of those? Or? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this one came in very early in the evening. Um, welcome abroad on board, everyone. Eager to hear from the boss monk tonight. <laughs> oh, I would like to get in early for Q and A time. I am a support worker for a local organization that offers support and home care. Some of my clients are very depressed and physically in a lot of pain. I offer my compassion, kindness and positivity and my sense of humor. How can I not take on board their individual suffering? How, the monk, how do the monks cope when they regularly interact with clients that are suffering? First of all, often I emphasize as much as I can with someone who's suffering. You try and feel their pain. But I think you know where I'm going with this, what I was told by Ajahn Chah. Just feel their pain. Empathize as much as you possibly can. But be like the rubbish bin with the hole in the bottom. You can receive everything, but you keep nothing. Because otherwise, if you're a care worker and you, and you if you don't empathise, you don't understand what they're feeling. Empathise as much as you can. And then when you receive all of their, for want of another, but it's not rubbish, but receive all their stuff, the problem with people is that sometimes they keep it with them. And they get more and more full, hour by hour, day by day, until they don't know how to let it go. So they also become sort of you know, what they were trying to help. So it's a beautiful simile. You let go of things which uh, the pain which you've seen in the day. But sometimes it happens that you know, just by listening, by caring, by empathizing, you never fully understand where another person comes from. We all live in one sense in our own worlds every human being. But we meet each other 
through the kindness and the care. Make sure that that kindness, that care is really strong. And often that's what people feel. Not the words, but where it's coming from. And that really helps them enormously. And you, know, you can give them a little piece of advice. Not really advice, but say, well, try this, this might work. And just the advice of, you know, if you are depressed, try and see the nice part of depression. I still remember at the Armadale group years ago, this guy was really badly depressed. And I asked him what he did that morning, and he said, well, just, not that morning, just that afternoon, just before he came to the Armadale group in the Armadale hospital. But um, he said, well, he had two tubs of ice cream. Exactly. Now, we always remember that depression has some advantages to it. Usually your family won't let you eat ice cream, especially not so much of an evening. So please, this is between me and you. When you start to feel better from the depression, don't tell your doctor or your family at all. Otherwise you lose all the privileges of being depressed. You probably have to go to work again and make your own bed and everything else. So when you start to see all of the benefits of depression, then people aren't depressed about being depressed. In other words, they don't add to it. So the word in Buddhism for suffering is called dukkha. We always used to call it about double dukkha. I don't want to suffer. I don't want to be depressed. So you are depressed. So be honest to it. It's here. Give it importance and learn from it. And I told this gentleman, learn how to exploit it. In other words, he started giving the depression a positive attitude. And once you have a positive attitude towards depression, you find the depression is gone. <laughs> You're enjoying it too much. <laughs> so that's the answer there. Thank you, uh, John. Catherine, would you like to ask a question? There you go. Hi, Catherine. Yeah. Hello, Arjan. Um, thank you very much for a really lovely introduction to the meditation. I say introduction because my mind then went off on its own little rehash of a difficult situation. Um, and so it was just looping through this and uh, uh, people, blah, 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 uh, uh, why are they so, uh, 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 making my life so difficult. And my, my question or my comment is around two minutes before the end, yeah. my mind said, if you don't get problems, you don't learn how to deal with problems. And it just went, bloom, bloom, it just fell away. But if you'd run the bell, if you'd run the bell three minutes before you did, yeah. I would have still been in. Wah, 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 wah. Um, so there's there's just such a randomness it feels around um, oh. that experience. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if it is random, honestly, because so often on a retreat. The last meditation is always the best. The last part of a meditation is often the best. It's as if your mind knew you had half an hour and they said, OK, I'll just do the normal stuff. I've only got a few minutes left, so I'm going to just be peaceful at the end. But you might give you a nice gift afterwards, so thank you, mind. I always say something positive in that, but it has been very true that I remember just the early years when during the range retreat I would give monks the opportunity to do a quiet retreat for 14 or 15 days. We take food to them, they had no duties at all. And always when they would come out, how was your retreat? I was just getting into it. So on the 15th day, that's when they were really getting into it. So I said, okay, go for three weeks, have another seven days. It didn't work because on the 21st day, only then were they really getting into it. <laughs> and you saw there was something there, was an amount of time. It was just, it was just this little attitude which people have. It's almost as if you're always trying to do something 
and the very end you do let go. You don't try to do anything. And that's when things start to happen. You know, Kathy, you're coming up to Jhana Grove for the retreat soon. Again, so you're most welcome. And often I tell people, say, look, it's the, the, you're here for like a couple of weeks, I forget how much now. But say, after a couple of weeks, how is the meditation? I've only got one day left. So how was it? So I'm getting nowhere. I said, yeah, that's true. You won't get anywhere, Catherine. You're hopeless. And that's teaching. Because <laughs> that encourages you. What's he going to say? I'm hopeless. I've only got another day to go. And that, the last day is always the best. Stop trying. Just let the whole nature just happen by itself. And then whatever was the problem with that person in the past, you don't really know what the problem was. You know, it seems you do, but after a while you just let it go. Especially during meditation time, it's not worth it. I get so many people ask me about their problems. I don't know, I don't know how many people, it's like 40 or 50 today in the Armadale group. And, well, sorry, not the Armadale group, in the, the cancer support group. And then you've got the monks and the anagamicas and other people, people calling in. So it can be just really so much stuff. But at least I've learned how to let it go. The times for meditation, that's quiet time. It's my rest time. And it's really important. And I care for my quietness. And I know that's the best way I can help others afterwards. Trying to work out their problems or work out my problems or any other problems is a total waste of time. So. Those things come in, but say, shh, mind. You not don't turn it off, but just say, shh, calm down. You can always take your hand, poor old Catherine, <laughs> how to deal with all of this. <laughs> You're doing the meditation, and that helps. <laughs> it's showing yourself some kindness, and it doesn't really matter. I don't know if that answered the question or not, but thank you. Thank you, Ajay. I have another another message in the chat for you. Not a question, but just a sharing. I started the meditation with a pain flare-up I've been dealing with, but what you said about showing care to your own fever, I did that. I said to my pain, what do you need? What can I do for you? How can I care for you? I finished the meditation with the pain dull dramatically and feeling so relaxed. I usually battle with my body so much and the pain I have, but this felt so much better. Thank you. Well done. And uh, now we have um, uh, another message. Uh, once while I was meditating, I saw myself hung on a rope, and the rope actually was my breath going in and out. When I thought about this, I felt like our body is like an empty balloon, that we breathe air in and out, which switches on our eyes, nose, ears, tongue, skin and minds. Our breath, the air that we take in and out, is no difference to the air that is outside. Is it necessary to breathe? Well, just don't even bother about that. It's the body's job to breathe, not yours. And I trust my lungs. They've been breathing for, again, 71 years. Hasn't let me down once. So I trust my lungs know how to breathe and how much to breathe. I never tell my lungs what to do. Just, I just carry on. You know, you know how to breathe after all these years. Is it necessary? Just let your lungs decide. You just get out of the way and let your lungs do the job they need to do. Sometimes in deep meditation, you don't breathe. And I mean that. This is just really in the very deep meditations. That's why be careful, because sometimes people might think you're dead. That happened to this gentleman years ago. He went into his room. He was just watching the TV with his wife. And he went into his bedroom to meditate for half an hour. That was his usual maximum. And after an hour, an hour and a half, he hadn't come out. So his wife went in there to check in on, on him. He wasn't breathing. She looked at him. There's no breath coming out. 
And that was the story where they rang the ambulance. And the ambulance came rushing in. They were, they were not so um, silent. He was still meditating. They made a lot of noise and checked him. And he, he wasn't breathing. He got into a very deep meditation. And I won't tell the whole story. But, you know, when he came out of the meditation an hour or two later in the hospital, he went and I was like, where am I? I was in my bedroom. What am I doing in the hospital? It was perfectly okay. It was actually one of the best experiences of his life. But, you know, even the doctors couldn't see any breath. It had stopped. It was so still, he didn't need any breath. So is it necessary? Let your lungs decide. I asked him, was there anything unpleasant about the whole experience? He said, well actually there was something unpleasant. Because after he came out of his meditation, the hospital they sent him to was Charlie Gardner's hospital, not Armadale. And uh, the doctor said, there's nothing wrong with you. You're a perfectly fit specimen. You know, go home. So he walked home with his wife. He said, that was unpleasant. The scolding he got from his wife. Don't you ever do that again, she said. I was really scared. I thought you died. That was the only unpleasant thing. Other than that, it was just really blissing out, having a wonderful time. Inside, five senses turned off. So those are the beautiful things about meditation. He was a lay person, he's a good meditator, but you know, it's amazing what people get up to. Anyway, another question? Yes, another question, anyone? Anyone wish to ask another question? Oh, Gloria's got a hand up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Gloria. Uh, thank you for your advice that you given that you have given another day. So I had this problem that is concerning my uh, social relationship. I have a very I I I don't really like myself for most of the time because I have a very deep feeling that my existence is causing other people to be painful and unhappy and even suffering. So. Uh, and I struggle a lot in this, so can you give me some advice? Thank you. Well, no, Gloria, you are here every week, and you also listen to all my talks in Nonamara Temple, because I know you're always asking the questions there. All of the people who know you from previous talks, what do you think about Gloria? Does she cause any of you trouble? I love Gloria. Okay, <laughs> so is she really good? Put your thumbs up really good if you like Gloria. Look, everyone's got their thumbs up. You don't, <laughs> you don't even, Christina's got a heart there for you. You don't cause and people I trouble. Love question. Do I, John? I must say that I love your questions, Gloria. I always learn yeah. something from the past. So you've got some friends, Gloria. And remember the friends which you have here. All you need in life is a few good friends. And those good friends are just really pure-hearted and kind. And I just look at you and just, you know, you don't cause people suffering at all. You're just a really nice person, a wonderful person. I don't know what you do in like, your life. Are you a policewoman or something? Or a, a traffic cop? Or a dentist? <laughs> no, I shouldn't say that, dentist. <laughs> so a lot of times what you're doing and I think this is the two bad bricks in a wall. You can see the two bad bricks in your life. But remember, there's 998 good bricks here, and all the people here, that's what their job. They point out the good bricks. So you're a fine person, no, no trouble. And after a while, you actually start to believe that. It's great to be able to hang out, or at least be part of like a group like this, a very lovely, wonderful, positive-minded people, because that's the old lots of love to Gloria from Christine Mack. And that's about the elephant story which the Buddha told. An elephant was really a royal elephant, that's like a Rolls Royce in those days, because the king would go on top of the elephant to go through the jungle safely. But then one day that elephant turned into a really bad elephant. No one knew why. He got doctors out and nothing seemed to be physically wrong with him. And then somebody discovered the reason why the elephant went bad and negative 
was because behind the elephant stall, that was where a group of thieves, bandits, you know, bad people, they would meet every evening because it was secluded. And they discussed where they were going to rob, what drug debts they were going to get back, who they were going to beat up, even kill. Really bad people. And because the elephant had been listening to them, even though the elephant didn't understand a word of what these bad people were saying, that the elephant became bad. And all the, this minister in this government, all he did was to arrest those thieves and get the monks and the nuns to go behind the elephant's door, just to meditate, to talk Dhamma, to tell bad jokes. <laughs> no, let's have a positive, happy, happy conversations instead of the conversations of the monk, of the um, the bandits, the bad guys. And then the elephant became an even better elephant than it was before. So it's just conditioning. So you you keep it on this meditation group here, the Armadale group and the group over in Bodhinyana, whatever is going on, and you soon associate with good people and you find your another happy Gloria. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. I'd like you to just have a look at the chat box too because there are some beautiful messages that have come through for you. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Good. Uh, John, um, Tony would like to ask you a question. Unfortunately, he doesn't, has been unable to find his camera this evening. Okay. Tony, would you like to go ahead? Audio, yeah. Christian, thank you, Ajahn. Uh, I'm in the dark tonight, unfortunately. I, I, uh, I'm having some technical problems. Um, Ajahn, uh, I just want to pick up a little on what you uh, just commented on about the, the um, uh, the beauty of uh, uh, having such a group um, that can uh, get together online because I live in Tasmania and um, uh, I don't know any other Buddhists and uh, there are um, other traditions um, of Buddhists um, in Tasmania but um, none that are, uh, you know, Thai forest and it, it just has changed my life being able to hook up with um, both the BSWA and the um, Victorian uh, Association as well right. and so I for one and I'm sure I speak uh, um, or I feel the same that um, yeah, it's just an absolute blessing that um, that we can do this, and and um, yeah, uh, just a huge heartfelt thank you. Mm. That's very nice. Thank you for saying that. We know we have many monks who come here to to teach. You know, it's also for them. It's where they can grow as well. I've been a monk for a long time now. For some of these other monks, it's great for them to talk with you and they train, they become confident. As a monk, as a nun, sometimes people lack that confidence. Sometimes the monks say, oh, I can't teach. My goodness, you can. And so usually the Armado group here is also where we encourage some of the younger monks or nuns to teach. And they learn. And they say some wonderful things and they grow. When they get that confidence, it means that you know, we, we create teachers. This is a training monastery. And so, you know, years ago, and I'm quite a well-known teacher now, but years ago, one of our visitors went into our library and they got one of the earliest talks that I gave here, maybe about 35 or 36 years ago. And they came up to me afterwards and said, Ajahn Brown, I just heard one of your earliest talks about 36 years ago. It was hopeless, <laughs> she said. It was terrible. <laughs> and she laughed and said, but the talks these days are wonderful. And I, I, she was laughing all the time. It just was saying that you're not born a good teacher, you learn, you grow. You're not born a good meditator, you learn and grow and get the skills of life. And so it's wonderful. And I've been a monk such a long time and seen all these other monks learn and grow and nuns as well become wonderful teachers. 
that's the other thing, and you help there by giving that positive feedback, by allowing us to teach and laughing at my jokes. <laughs> and little by little, the confidence grows, which is wonderful. Okay, great. Okay, Nixon would just like to say, um, uh, wish I can come for a retreat too, but not lucky yet due to family commitments and a huge smile for you, Ajahn. And Shirley, she says she totally agrees with Tony. Joining the Armadale Meditation Group is one of the best things I've done this year. Lovely group, fabulous and hilarious teachers. And I would also <laughs> like to thank Ajahn, having discovered your pod podcast about five years ago before I joined the group here. Uh, more than a year ago, just slightly more than a year ago, I have learned so much and I feel so much happier with myself. So I would just like to add my thanks to you too, Arjun. That's wonderful. But always remember that each one of you are teachers. In a sense, you have partners, you have friends, family members, people you work with. And for whatever you gain on this group, you share with so many people afterwards without you even knowing it. Sometimes they, you get surprised, they say you're a wonderful person. Thank you. And why are you a wonderful person? Because you have groups like this which encourage you and uplift you and give you some wonderful similes for life. Thank you, Rajan. Uh, Pinder has a question. Pinder, would you... oh, no, not a question, just a comment. Thank you, John Brown. Um, what I found over the last year, uh, 18 months during the COVID thing, is the younger monks, or the newer monks, you know, when, you, when we have the daily meditations, yes. for half an hour, and I found great new teachers there. Yeah. So they've got experience, so that was really, really young. Uh, Great because now they're more confident and they they yeah. they become better at imparting the knowledge. I mean, with all knowledgeable, they are all knowledgeable, but yeah. they impart that they pass it on. Is is the gift. So that's and they've progressed. They've really come. Yeah, yeah come down, gone far along the road. So thank you. I must admit, the one thing we haven't been doing enough is having the nuns come on a Tuesday evening. I'd love to have that happen when they're ready. The thing is, I can never force anybody, I would never force anybody to do anything. But when they're ready, oh, we've got a big resource there. Yes, having heard some of the podcasts that the nuns made, oh, yeah. I agree wholeheartedly, it would be wonderful when they're ready. Uh, is there anybody else who would like to ask a question or make a comment? Um, Martha, would you like to make a comment or ask a question this evening? <clears throat> no, and I think it's all super helpful. I'm not, I'm like that first question, that first question being about um, let's focus on music. Hold on. Yeah. Um, you know, well, I like that about the painful body too. That was extremely helpful too. But um, well, somewhere in the question about the caregiver. Someone was talking about being a uh, caregiver yeah. and um, being super drained all the time. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and how to deal with that. And, uh, I, you know, what y'all have taught me, I'm just working on already, which is yeah. effort and then just not pushing away, like you said. Good, yeah. And I'm working in a way that I'm not been able to do before. Yeah. So, um, yeah. It is also true. You always think that you're giving care, but the other people, they you learn so much from them. Okay, here it was. Yeah. The depression. Given the depression, a positive attitude, given a piece of advice, this is going backwards here. Um, and that is a very helpful image for me to feel empathy, but be like the rubbish bin. Yeah. Did you hear that? Yeah. An accent. Ew. The trash can. Then, well, um, with a hole in the bottom and let it go. And that has been very helpful for me to just, I've been practicing that of late because I'm surrounded by negativity all the time. 
pretty much so much so that like you know why bother you my goodness is it me is it me but um that uh not pushing away but not clinging to it either yeah. and um i appreciate the fact that talking about getting older also yeah you know it's easier for me to do that if i've gotten older for some yeah. reason not to not to try not cling to it to the point where i i, I couldn't be a therapist before yeah um because i all of that i literally was just like oh, i didn't even that's not a question i'm sorry i don't mean to call I, I just want to say thank you um let's see um we had uh one question here from oh where are we where are we where are we goodness me oh melanie are you right would you like to ask your question now melanie yeah. is thank you Ajahn. um i had a question because i know uh you you sometimes say you have to be kind to yourself yeah. and not to push yourself too hard. But on the other hand, sometimes I heard, uh, according to the sutta, you have to practice as if you I can't remember if it's your hair or your house or your hat is in fire. So, um, so how can I do both? At the same time, be kind to myself and maybe practice more because I'm not... I'm not at that state where I, it's so blissful in my meditation. But it's, it's good enough, I would say, it's getting yeah. better. <laughs> that's good. Well, sometimes that's why we monks shave our hair off, so the hair comes off <laughs> dry, and then we can relax a bit more. But it's important, you know, that there is you know, there's a way out of this, it's important uh, to be able to sit down and relax and look after yourself. Some people say, Ajahn Brahm, you're going on a retreat for three months. Isn't that being selfish? It is what it's doing. It's actually giving myself and the other monks a time for ourselves to really build up the energy of meditation and also the power of the care. And that means when we come out, we'll be more powerful, more helpful for everybody. So it's teaching by example also. If you are a carer, great, but also spend time caring for yourself. If you need time out, take time out. In the United States they have this beautiful term called the restroom. Yes, yeah, a toilet, <laughs> WC in Australia, <laughs> but still it's a great place where you can go and to have, to meditate. People ask me, how can we meditate at, ho at home or in the office? See, go to the restroom. That's what it's there for, have a rest. <laughs> and if the, your boss tells you why you're spending so much time in the restroom, just be honest. Say you're constipated. Mentally constipated. <laughs> you need a bit of a break. <laughs> so anyway, that's just one solution there. And Fionn from Corsica has got a question. Fionn, Hi, would you like to know? Yeah. Adam Brown, you changed my life completely and all the loved ones around me because I'm less evil. Um, every day, my husband says so many times, in situation, I have three uh, teenager, teenagers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when I'm in a hot, uh, a difficult spot, my husband will say, what will your mom say? What will your mom say in this situation? <laughs> so it's the every day. It's okay. the every day so many times my husband will say, what will your mom say? What will your mom say? I say, I know what, what, what my mom will say, but I cannot do it yet. Yeah. But it's getting there. Yeah, good. Excellent. That's wonderful to be of So thank you, thank you. You are welcome. And thank you for... Is your husband French or is he... He's French, yes. Oh, okay. I'll just let him know for me. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> well, and we have a delightful message from Penang as well. 
uh, Ajahn. Much gratitude, gratitude to Ajahn and this cozy Armadale meditation group online Zoom because I'm in Penang. Keeps me inspired and more dedicated to practice, more consistently. Always looking forward to Tuesdays. Big thank you. Is that Jennifer? Uh, that's Jennifer. Yes, it is yeah. Jennifer. Yes, it's Jennifer uh, Aja. Yeah, I, I just got a message from mm -hmm. Chao Po today. I was thinking of him. Oh! I used to go. He's got your t shirt. Yeah, I know. These are all the people I used to go once a year to Hong Kong to visit, but since the COVID time, it just got very difficult. But anyway, we still keep in touch. Penang is one of my favourite places. I, I admit that. People are so nice. We'll wait for you, you Ajahn. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you for Tuesday. Okay, no trouble at all. Any other questions or comments? Uh, I think that last chance going once, twice, three times. I think that might be it, Ajahn. Oh, okay. Um, if yeah. it's a comment, I yeah. wanted to say, like with Gloria, that there was this story on Facebook and it was about some guy who bought a Jeep for his daughter. This was a very, very old Jeep. And he told her to go get it appraised. So she went to a like a second-hand car dealership and they said, oh, maybe give you $1,000 for it. And then she took it to a pawn shop and they said, oh, we'll give you $100 for it. And then she took it to an actual Jeep club and they said it was a collector's item and they offered her $100,000 for it. That's and the moral of that story was that your value is often dependent on kind of who you're with and, you know, you just need to find the right circumstances and the right place to value you. That's wonderful. Totally agree. Thank you. Thank you. Since you like stories. Yes, I do, yes. <laughs> Those are lovely stories, Sarah. Thank you. Um, I also have a message from Laura Lee in uh, Kobe. She says she's very thank you, th thankful for these sessions, Ajahn, and all who volunteered to bring them to us, including Marlene and Chris. And she is asking what will she do without them for the next three months? Well, there's a quick answer. Come and join the wonderful program that Marlene has put together for the Range Retreat. And she's asked also, do you have any suggested reading for a layperson, Ajahn? Me? Hey, oh, yeah. Sometimes it's a few books which I wrote. Um, and the earlier ones, I think, are some of the best. There are things like Open the Door of Your Heart. Somebody just came here, they, they gave me a copy, it was translated into Burmese. Uh, a new one, they're just distributing it for free in Burma. And so it's simple teachings, but they're very easy to read. But because you understand them and they're simple, don't ever uh, think they're not valuable. Some of the most simple teachings are the deepest. And then there's also the uh, who ordered the truckload? No, that's the who ordered the truckload of Dung. That was the same book. It was like Good, Bad, Who Knows, which is also a lovely little book. And there's some of the teachings in Good, Bad, Who Knows, are some very powerful, deep ones. So try those ones. But when you read them, don't read them once. Read them twice, three times, and you finally get more deep stories from them, more understanding. Yeah, thank you, Ajahn. Uh, we do have um, people asking, yes, we are continuing uh, the same Zoom links that you've already been sent. We will be continuing each week throughout the rains. Uh, so please all do feel free to come. It's the same Zoom links that you've already received, uh, and those Zoom links are valid through to uh, The program is on the... Uh, uh, BSWA website if you want to access it and have a look and see our speakers we have some wonderful speakers and Marlene has thankfully put together a, an absolutely wonderful program this year so thank you Marlene and Jennifer says keep smiling your sweet sweet smile Gloria 
So, uh, Jan, um, Fionn, did you want to make another comment or are you okay? No. Okay. I'm good. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm good too, uh, John. And I would like to say thank you to uh, John. It's been a wonderful evening. Uh, John, if you're not too tired, would you like to leave us with a blessing? Yes, certainly. Oh. And the blessing, I'll do it in English. In this, uh, whatever you have done in the past, may you let it go. Whatever you're doing right now, may it be peaceful and beautiful. May you always respect yourself. And if you want a happy future, please exercise not just your body, but your mind. So I would ask you to please look in the mirror every morning. And with your two fingers, do push-ups. <laughs> <laughs> to be happy. And if you don't have anybody who can understand you, you can always give yourself a hug. <laughs> <laughs> if you do it, do it full on. Really go for it. You don't get sued by uh, somebody else for hugging yourself. And you can't catch what you don't already have. So a self-hug is one of the easiest ways in the world to make peace with yourself. Okay, so that's physical exercise, hugging and push-ups. <laughs> okay, so take care everybody. See you again soon. Bye. See. Bye. Have a good day. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> I see a few kisses being blown. I thought that doesn't actually go over the internet. But never mind. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. <laughs>